Today's video is brought to you by Fabulous. More on them in a bit. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm Simon, your host here. What happens here? One of my writers in this case. This is a new writer, Matt, Matt Granza. Welcome, welcome, Matt. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Doesn't matter. Um, thanks, Matt, for this. Uh, what happens? I am going to uh, read what Matt has written for me. I've got it in front of me. It's a script. If you're new here, the format is I've never read it before. We're going to explore it together. It's going to be... It's not going to be fun. Look, the script is called the Benoit or Benoit tragedy. I looked it up. I wasn't sure whether it was like... You know one of those words where it's like the Americans have taken a French word like uh, St. Louis uh, or like St. Louis or whatever, and they've called it like St. Louis. This isn't a great example. There are other examples of this. So I don't know. I'm guessing it's Benoit, because that was the first thing in my pronunciation dictionary that came up. Uh, it's from Crippler to Killer. And that is why... Did I say we were going to enjoy this together? <laughs> so that's exactly true, is it? Uh, let's just get into it. And uh, yeah, that's it. Let's go. Hey, it's not quite it. You enjoying this podcast? Leave a review. You're enjoying this YouTube show? Also goes out as a video if you're just listening. It goes out on YouTube. Find it by searching The Casual Criminalist. Like it. Subscribe. Why don't you? The day was the 24th of June 2007, and myself along with countless fans across the globe were waiting eagerly for the big event to begin. The event in question was vengeance. Night of the Champions, a professional wrestling pay-per-view under the banner of the WWE, also known as World Wrestling Entertainment, airing live from the Toyota Center. Sorry. Airing live from the Toyota Center in Houston. Whenever I see it, see, I just want to read it out the announcer voice. Uh, in Texas, where it had been advertised that every championship would be defended on that night. I know absolutely, it's going to come as a shock to absolutely nobody. I know nothing about WWE. All I know is that once upon a time, it was called the WWF for World Wrestling Federation, I believe. And then the World Wildlife Fund were like, yo, what the f***, man? We had that first, you d***s. And so I, I think they had to change it to WWE. I remember that happened when I was a kid. And it was confusing. And I was like, well, these are clearly different things. Why do we need to do this? We understand they're different. It's not like anyone turns on the TV, tunes into WWF and is disappointed there's not a f panda. I mean, honestly, there could be a panda wrestling because the WWE gets crazy. Also, it's all fake, right? I actually made a video about that. How's that possible? why it's fake and all of this stuff is a surprisingly interesting history. I think that was on my channel called Today I Found Out. You can check it out if you want to. I'm not going to provide a link because I absolutely will forget. And some people are listening as a podcast, so they don't get to see those links. Brilliant, Simon. Thanks for that information. Let's carry on. One of the main selling points of the show was that we could see the crowning of a new ECW world champion as the title had been vacant for weeks. I have no idea what ECW means. In one corner was CM Punk, a young fan favorite, and in the other was Chris Benoit, a grizzled veteran who had the love and respect of fans the world over. And if I'm... G okay, look, let me see if I can find this goddamn Chris Benoit dude. Chris Benoit. Benoit! It's got this, you know, this weird um, pronunciation thing. If I click on it, will it play it? No, it just gives me the Wikipedia guide on how to pronounce it. But it, the, the pronunciation guide is forward slash B upside down E N apostrophe W A two arrow signs pointing to each other forward. So I should learn how to read this, but I'm pretty sure that means it's Benoit. So that's what we're going with. Rock and roll, baby. 8 p.m. rolled around and the show had begun. The ECW what did, did did Matt tell me what ECW stood for? <laughs> no. If he did, I didn't pick up on it. Oh no. He's like, Simon, you don't know what ECW is. Everyone knows what ECW is, Simon. It's okay, we already know. I really took care of it, honey. <laughs> you don't like wrestling, you small brain. The ECW World Title Match was the third bout on the card, and CM Punk made his way into the ring. We all await the familiar music signaling the arrival of the rabid Wolverine, but much to everyone's surprise, Benoit was nowhere to be seen being replaced at the last minute. Benoit missing an event, let alone a large PPV. PP oh, pay-per-view. Like, that big brain, like Night of the Champions, was almost unheard of as professional wrestling was quite literally the most important thing in his life. Pay-per-view stuff, like the boxing stuff. This sh is like, it's super expensive. It could be like 50, 60, 70 bucks. 
And I'm like, who the hell pays for that? I even struggle to pay. I, I mean, I even struggle. Like, I'll be watch. I'll be like, okay, you know, I've got the Apple TV or whatever, and you could just buy movies for like four bucks, three pounds, a hundred crowns in my local currency or whatever. And I'm always like, nope. I'll watch something for free on Netflix. I'm not paying that. So the idea that I'll pay like 50 pounds or 50 or however much it is, it's a lot for wrestling. I'm just like, what's going on? No. No, I definitely, definitely not pirate it. Never would do that. Cut to the next day of June the 25th, and I'm getting on WWE.com looking for some information about what to expect for Monday Night Raw that evening. As the homepage opens up and I saw the news headline, my heart dropped into my stomach. And my mouth hung in open shock. Chris Benoit has died. That night's episode of Raw was turned into a tribute to the Canadian crippler showing some of his best matches in his career from WWE and WCW, all while the announcers and his fellow wrestlers would talk about how much they respected him and how amazing of a wrestler and person he was. But this would be premature in the worst possible way. The next day, on June the 26th, ECW. I have not, why is ECW? <laughs> I don't know. It's an entertainment circus wrestling. I d d d d who knows? ECW was set to air and Vince McMahon appeared on a pre-recorded video with a message to the audience directly. Long quote, here we go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Last night on Monday Night Raw, the WWE presented a special tribute show recognizing the career of Chris Benoit. However, some 26 hours later, the facts of this horrific tragedy are now apparent. Therefore, other than my comments, there will be no mention of Mr. Benoit's name tonight. On the contrary, tonight's show will be dedicated to everyone who has been affected by this terrible incident. This evening marks the first step of the healing process. Tonight, WWE performers will do what they do better than anyone else in the world. Entertain you. And people might be thinking, Simon, like, thinking, Simon, why didn't you pull the clip? Why didn't you show this guy speaking at the camera? Why do you have to read it? when this is clearly a video clip that exists. I'm like, people who mentioned that in the comments on YouTube, let me introduce you to a little thing called copyright, where this would absolutely be fair use, which is this special thing in copyright where you get to use something that's copyrighted material because you're there's several different reasons you can use it and it's all kind of a bit of a sliding scale. But using it in a true crime video would be totally fair. But there is absolutely no f***ing way that YouTube are like, WWE is getting all your money. And I so that's why that's why we don't pull clips like that i know this video would be a lot better this podcast would be a lot better if we did because no one wants to hear me read this when it exists as audio but alas the world we live in is that the world i want to get off ever since that day wwe has not acknowledged chris Benoit on their programming their websites their dvds modern or their video games outside of interviews with vince and other wrestlers on podcasts and different media platforms it's as if benoit never even existed that's because the details coming out of the benoit home from that fateful weekend would turn the whole wrestling world on its head and cast a dark shadow over the sport that benoit himself loved more than anything we now take the plunge once more into the darkness looking into the eyes of a man destroyed by his profession and his own choices in the search for success and the violent and demented end that consumed him and those he loved a small man in a world of giants to explain the events of that dark weekend we have to head to the very beginning. Born Christopher Michael Benoit on May 21, 1967 in Montreal, Quebec, Canada to Michael and Margaret Benoit, Chris became enraptured with professional wrestling from a very young age. Living with his family in Edmonton, Alberta, he grew up idolizing legends such as the Dynamite Kid, Tom Billington, and Bret the Hitman Hart. He even took to using the diving headbutt from the top rope as a finishing maneuver, inspired by Billington's use of the move. This is like wrestling. It's like, in the real world, you're in a fight. It's like, how are you going to finish that person in a street fight? Diving headbutt from the top of the ropes. Said nobody ever. <laughs> Is a suplex a wrestling thing? I feel like that's, that's the one of the only terms I know. I don't even know what it is. But it's like number of times that a suplex is probably used in real life rest in real life fighting is probably zero because it's like what do people do in real life? They punch you in the face, don't they? They kick you in the groin. They kick the shit out of your shins. <laughs> this is like uh, uh, God damn it! What's the name of that super popular fighting sport? Um, the one a uh, mixed martial arts. And it's like, that is like, 
properly intense. I don't like it because I don't like seeing people beat the shit out of each other. But it is like that's pr that's proper fighting, isn't it? Upon coming of age, Benoit began traveling with Stu Hart, the father of his idol Brett, at the world famous Hart Family Dungeon, and in 1985 would make his professional wrestling debut for Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling. While there, Chris married his first wife, Martina, in 1988, siring two children, David in 1993 and Megan in 1997. I love the word siring. You can't just say, he had two children, he sired them. Like an ancient king. He stayed with Stampede Wrestling until the promotion closed in 1989, heading to Japan from there. It's worth noting that while technically masterful of his craft, Benoit was always a smaller man, at least by pro wrestling standards, billed at 5'11 and weighing 229 pounds. Hey, hey, I'm 5'11 and I am a tower of a man. I am big. A uh, smaller man like himself would have been looked down on at the time. They weren't taken seriously. Is 5'11 really short? <laughs> I feel like I'm just shy of six foot. Come on, give me a break. That's why, even in his younger days, Chris indulged in a plethora of steroids in an attempt to measure up to the previous standards of what a pro wrestler should look like. Yeah, it's fair. I also take a lot of step. Not really. Not really. Something he'd also do in order to stand out is take on a more heart hitting style to that of his peers and take some unnecessary risks in the ring, including taking chair shots directly to the head. While it was commonplace for wrestlers to get their hands up in order to protect themselves partially from the damage, Benoit was the type to take the headshot on without any sort of precaution. Oh my god. I feel like, I know that we've probably known about this for a really long time, but I feel like it's just become like in the news cycle and more relevant recently, just how damaging repeated blows to the head can be. Like I knew a mate who had to stop doing sports, like proper, like he used to love playing football, like simple soccer, football. Because he'd been concussed so many times, the doctor was like, yo, you can't get concussed again. You can't do any sports. Even if it's just a tiny risk of concussion, you can't do it. Because your brain is already getting damaged. And no more. Because the concussions, apparently, they, like, um, accumulate or something. And it's why, like, you know, there's all these football helmets and stuff, and American football and all this stuff. And I'm like, how about we just, let, let's just not bash our heads around the place. I've never had a concussion. And I hope that I never will. Benoit wrestled for New Japan Pro Wrestling as both Pegasus Kid and Wild Pegasus from 1986 to 1997, and in 1994 he would make his way stateside for Extreme Championship Wrestling. I'm not sure if I was a wrestler if I'd go for the name Pegasus. Pegasus to me feels like a very, and I'm sure there are female wrestlers, but you know, it feels like for a dude it's quite feminine, isn't it? You know, the Pegasus, oh it's like a beautiful unicorn, <laughs> it's got the big horn sticking out of his head. It's something that little girls like. I'm just being sexist here, but it's a, it's a Pegasus. I'd be like, just call me the Wild Tiger, baby. Wrestling under his real name, it was an ECW that did gain his famous Crippler moniker during a match on the November to Remember, sorry, November to Remember pay per view. Benoit accidentally botched a maneuver that ended with his opponent Sabu landing directly on top of his head, breaking his neck. Oh my God! Wait, Sa? Oh, okay. So, oh, Sabu broke his neck. He broke Sabu's neck. You know. Oh my god, dude. That's intense for like fake fighting. Sabu would eventually recover from a broken. Oh, okay, so you could break your neck without being like uh, disabled, right? Um, where you, you know. His work visa expired in 1995, and he shortly afterwards got the phone call from WCW World Championship Wrestling. Now, before we continue with today's video, let me tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Fabulous. Have you ever found it difficult to rewire your brain and adapt to a new routine? I know that I absolutely have, and that's where the Fabulous app comes in. It's essentially a digital coach that helps you get that new routine and adapt to it right by being right there by your side and giving you all that positive enforcement that you love. Fabulous app is a digital coach, a happiness trainer that uses insights from behavioral science like that. I like it when it's not all wishy-washy, but it's actually science-based, that's important, to develop great habits that will enable you to live the life that you want. They've got a community of 30 million users from around the world, and they make it easy to develop and stick to healthy habits thanks to science-backed daily routines. You'll learn to create rituals morning, afternoon, and night, I have to say, so far. I've only cracked on with the morning ones, fabulous, but I'm getting there. And you take small steps each day that lead to big and long-lasting changes. Now, uh, they say here, what problems did you face in your life? And I was like, there were a couple, well, mostly, I have my stuff's always around health. <laughs> It's just I'm not very healthy and I want to be better. And so Fabulous was like, okay, 
Why don't you try drinking water in the morning? I'm like, fabulous, look, I could drink water in the morning if I, and then I'm like, oh God, I don't drink water in the morning at all, do I? So I was like, all right, fabulous, let's give it a go. Let's make that a part of my morning routine. And now every day, it's like, hey, Simon, you're drinking that water? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I am. I have like a big pint glass of water and I drink the whole thing. And then uh, I, it's like, you know, it's, it's, this is one of those behavioral science things, isn't it? Because I go in there and I'll like, click that box off feeling good about myself and now i do it every day and it's great another one this wasn't actually from fabulous i went to the doctor my like yearly medical checkup and they were like you need to get on the treadmill mate and i'm like what look, look at me I'm, I'm fit and healthy and they're like yeah well your blood work says otherwise <laughs> you need to exercise and so i went onto the fabulous app and they were like how much exercise do you want to do do you want it to be hard and i'm like yes i mean no but yes and so then I, I, I got into running three times a week and then I got the flu for a week. And then, I mean, fabulous accounts for that. They're like, don't worry about it, mate. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, I was sick. I was in bed. But now I'm feeling better. Next week, back on it. Going to be checking off those little boxes in fabulous, making myself feel good. Yes. But you can go at your own pace. Like I say, you don't have to be your hardcore. I was like, I'm getting into it. I'm not even that hardcore. I'm not even doing those afternoon and evening routines yet. They keep asking me to. And I'm like, bro bro look at my water consumption dude i'm doing well <laughs> thank you no but i will so look start building your ideal daily routine the first 100 people who click the link below will get 25 percent off a fabulous subscription which is brilliant again click the link below first 100 people who do will get 25 percent off a fabulous subscription check it out and uh, yeah now back to today's video enter woman Feels like Eddie Woman, stage left. <laughs> it didn't take long for Benoit to impress the higher ups in WCW with his technical and hard hitting style. Soon enough, he was placed into higher profile programs and was even drafted into the newest incarnation of the Four Horsemen, one of the greatest stables in wrestling history. <laughs> Got no idea what any of this stuff is. It was during his time with the Horsemen that he began a rivalry with Kevin Sullivan, Sullivan sorry, leader of a rival stable the Dungeon of Doom, as well as one of the bookers of WCW. For clarification, a booker is someone who decides the storylines and outcomes of matches on the programming. This is it's basically a writer, isn't it? Because it's all scripted, right? It's a, it's a lie. This is where we meet woman, real name Nancy Sullivan, at the time Kevin Sullivan's on-screen valet and real-life wife. While on television, she was portrayed as cunning, ruthless, and vicious, as a tough-as-nails lady who didn't need no man. Off-screen, Nancy Sullivan was the closest thing to an angel as could possibly be imagined. Kind, caring, thoughtful, nurturing, she was a sweetheart in every sense of the word. During Benoit's feud with Sullivan, Kevin believed it would make rather engaging television to book Nancy to have an on-screen affair with Chris. They would be seen kissing and holding hands openly while on television, playing it up for the cameras, and even going so far as to spend more time together while off-screen to play it up in public for the fans. This is another weird thing about wrestling, right? Because it is fake and it is scripted, and they're like, yeah, 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 you have an affair with this person. But then it's also, it's it's this weird blending of the real world because they, they're amping it off-screen. It'd be like two soap opera actors in real life also being seen together to make it seem more realistic. It's like, why well, we know it's fake. Why do we have to extend it into the real world? I mean, in a way, it's very clever. Like, it's sort of this um, semi-reality, reality TV show slap. I mean, even reality TV shows are heavily, not scripted, but pushed towards certain storylines, right? To make it more entertaining. It's, it's clever. It's clever, but bizarre. Engaging television, yes, but this also ended up bringing Chris and Nancy closer together. So much so that they started a real-life affair with one another. Who could have guessed? This soured the relationship between Kevin and Chris. <laughs> no shit. Making things quite volatile backstage between the two. This soon resulted in Nancy moving out and divorcing Kevin, citing physical abuse, and Benoit moving in with her soon after, his own marriage to Martine having fallen apart as well. Surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Come February 25th, 2000, Chris and Nancy welcomed little Daniel Benoit into the world, and on November the 23rd of the same year, the loving couple were officially married. rise to the top. Benoit remains with WCW until January the 16th, 2000. He'd been outspoken for quite a while about how unhappy he was with the company, particularly with Kevin Sullivan being promoted to head booker. Only weeks later, on January the 31st, Benoit made his debut for the WWE, then WWF, on Monday Night Raw. 
Chris would go on to win multiple championships and have many classic matches and rivalries with the likes of Triple H, Booker T, Edge. Wait, Booker T, Edge, or Booker T and Edge? I've never even heard of any of these people. Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle. The apex of his career came in 2004 when, in the main event of WrestleMania 20 in Madison Square Garden, Chris Benoit would win the World Heavyweight Championship. Nancy was in attendance with Daniel and David, and they were brought down to the ring to celebrate as fireworks went off and confetti poured down from the rafters as the crowd cheered and chanted his name. In this sort of situation, is the winner predetermined and all? I think it is, he is right. So it's like he won the world championship. It's like, yeah, in, in the in the fictional world of WWE, the booker decided that he was going to win. This guy's in second place. It's on his Wikipedia page. They don't have like world heavyweight champion of WWE, do they? Because he didn't. he's just a character in a show. It would be like, I don't know, a TV show. Your world is not real where one of the main characters is like a scientist and he win the Nobel Prize and they put it on his Wikipedia page as winning the Nobel Prize. No, he didn't. No. Not all was sunshine and rainbows, though, in the Benoit household. In May 2003, Nancy Benoit filed for divorce, divorce, citing domestic abuse, Benoit having gone so far as to throw furniture through the house. Well, he's probably used to it, you know, he's having throw furniture thrown against his head. He's probably like, this is normal. This is normal. This is what people do. At one point, Nancy called the marriage irrevocably broken and even took out a restraining order against Chris in which it stated that Benoit had, quote, lost his temper and threatened to strike the petitioner and cause extensive damage to the home and personal belongings of the parties, including furniture and furnishings. Petitioner is in reasonable fear for petitioner's own safety and that of the minor child. This is very legalese, isn't it? Petitioner is, respo is in reasonable fear of petitioner's own safety. Petitioner, yes? <laughs> One of their biggest argument points was Nancy wanting Chris to take a lighter schedule so that he could spend more time at home with his family and get some much needed rest. Chris, on the other hand, saw wrestling as his life and refused to step away if he felt he was needed. Another theorized struggle for the family was that Daniel was rumored to have fragile X syndrome, a form of autism that has been repeatedly denied. Nancy's sister, Sandra Toffoloni, states that Benoit never hit Nancy, though he did push her into a shelf once. There was that's still pretty intense, dude. That is still domestic violence. It's like, no, no, he never hit her. He just shoved her really hard with his fists into the wall. It was Sandra that Chris reached out to while under the restraining order, asking her to talk to Nancy for him. She did so, and after convincing her to speak with her husband, Nancy and Chris were able to reconcile, calling off the divorce. Not so irrevocably broken after all, was it? Outside of the marital issues, things were still great for Benoit. He was the consummate professional, even after losing the world championship, working hard and doing as he was asked. He continued to wrestle, continued to win championships, and entertain people across the globe. Everything was moving forward as normal until November of 2005. That was when the world of Chris Benoit and pro wrestling as a whole changed forever. Eddie Guerrero the tale of Chris Benoit would be incomplete without the mention of one very important person. Eddie Guerrero was a fellow professional wrestler and perhaps the most important person in Chris Benoit's life. Born on October 9, 1967, he was the youngest son of Corey Guerrero, a Mexican wrestling legend that helped bring the Lucha Libre style of wrestling to the United States. That's the one where they wear the masks, right? I've actually I realized, oh, here I am talking about how I know nothing about wrestling. I was in Mexico. And I went to see this. It was really bizarre and I didn't really like it. I'm like, this is just silly. Why? I feel like I'm watching something for children. <laughs> Why am I here? Like, I also feel WWE is also... I mean, I'm sure people are going to hate me for this one, but it's, it kind of feels a bit like it's for children to me. Doesn't it? A little bit? Just a, come up, just a little? And then throw some masks on them and it's like, okay, now this is for children. Eddie was born to be a professional wrestler, and it also helps that he was extremely good at it. He's known today as a wrestling legend in his own right, not for just his technical and high-flying style, but for his boundless charisma. His career also mirrored Benoit's in almost every aspect. Beginning down in Mexico, Eddie moved to New Japan Pro Wrestling in 1992, and it was there that he first met Chris. They soon became close, traveling the world together and supporting each other however they could. They were the best of friends, practically brothers. They even shared their world title wins together. Eddie had won the WWE World Championship in February 2004, and then a month later, at WrestleMania, Chris won the World Heavyweight title. Eddie, who had retained his title earlier in the night, made his way to the ring and celebrated 
celebrated with his best friend shedding tears of joy together as they embraced lovingly for the whole world to see. The two friends were on the highest of highs, but every high must come down, and this one crashed and burned in the worst possible way. It's a proven fact that many wrestlers, whether from the wear and tear of the sport or from drug-related issues, usually meet an untimely end, and sadly, this case is no different. I didn't know that wrestlers particularly met bad fates. I mean, I know there's the famous ones, but I always th- assume that th- I know about those because they're famous. Like, um, what's his name? The the the, the guy, the blonde Hulk Hogan. Um, he had some troubles with some stuff, didn't he? And then there was something where didn't he get didn't he sue someone? And then Peter Thiel was it was that Hulk Hogan or was that something else? I love that story. I'm gonna get it wrong if it's not Hulk Hogan, but I sh- I just assume most wrestlers just retired and went to go live on a farm somewhere and you know drink beer on the porch and enjoy relaxing retirement. <laughs> this is just what I assume American retirement is like for some reason. <laughs> just people living on farms and drinking beer on porches. <laughs> on November the 12th, 2005, Eddie and the rest of the roster stayed the night at the Marriott Hotel City Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Early the next morning, Eddie's nephew and fellow wrestler Chavo Guerrero was informed by hotel workers that his uncle hadn't answered his scheduled wake-up call. Making their way to Eddie's room and receiving no answer, they entered inside where they found Eddie passed out on the floor of the bathroom, toothbrush in hand. He was barely clinging to life, and before an ambulance could arrive, Eddie Guerrero passed away in his nephew's arms only 38 years of age. Even though Eddie's past had been riddled with severe drug problems, he had been clean for several years up to that point, and while a relapse was initially suspected, an autopsy revealed that Eddie had passed away from acute heart failure due to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Oh my god, at 38? I went to, I went to the doctor uh, as of recording yesterday, and he was like, yo, 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 your cholesterol was pretty high last year, whistle boy. He wasn't, he said, Mr. Whistler. <laughs> I feel like such an adult. now, <laughs> like, Mr. Whistler's like, okay. And they're like, we're going to do your blood work again. And if it comes back high, well, you're going to have to make some adjustments, aren't you? <laughs> and if that doesn't work, you're going to have to take some pills. And I'm like, I'm 35. Why am I taking pills for this? <laughs> Jesus. And then I looked it up and the, the, a, a Google were like, yeah, people take pills for this. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Just for privacy, I won't mention who it is, but someone else in my family also takes pills. They're a lot older than me for uh, high cholesterol. I felt like, oh my god. I felt really old. And then the doctor was like, you've put a bit of weight, haven't you? And I'm like, I have put on a bit of weight. Why can't I eat whatever I want to anymore, doctor? And he's like, well, as you get old, these proteins in your blood or something, and he explained the science thing to me. And I'm like, dude, I don't need to know why. I just know it's happening. <laughs> And so now I'm like, my years and decades of just eating whatever the fuck I want and drinking whatever I want all the time have finally come crashing to an end as my mid-thirties have arrived. It's very sad that I'm even drinking Diet Coke. <laughs> Which I've drunk forever. But um, I haven't eaten today. I'm doing this fasting thing. It's ten minutes past three. Every weekday I have one meal a day. I don't eat anything until dinner time. It's, uh, it's, I just find it better than, than doing the, not, you know, the, the eating specific food. This is not a show about my diet. Just let's get on with the bloody episode, Simon. <laughs> Although, please tell me in the comments, please tell me there are other people feeling this pain. <laughs> the decades of fun have come crashing down. All right, that's a different thing. Now, the reason I bring up Eddie so prevalently here is that his death was perhaps the single most devastating moment of Chris Benoit's life up until that point. On the documentary series The Dark Side of the Ring, Charbo spoke about the day Eddie died and how Benoit reacted to the news. Quote, Then I get a call from Chris, and Chris goes, Hey man, I'm downstairs, where are you? Hey man, are you sitting down, he says. Yes. And I go, Eddie passed away this morning. And all you hear from a guy with no emotion whatsoever, you're a whale. Just this wail from deep down, like a heartbreak. If you ever heard one, this was heartbreak. During the Raw tribute show to Eddie, Benoit could be seen weeping openly on television as the 10 bell salute rang out throughout the arena. In his tribute video, Chris sobbed openly and said how much he loved and missed Guerrero, and they would meet again. This is one of those things like the dudes who have, you know, like it's always in TV shows where you got that character who's just like, no emotions, always just making fun, super stoic. And then something sad happens and that character like has a tear roll down his cheek and you're like oh my god you've destroyed me it's uh what's that famous it's um in scrubs right 
that episode where uh, like the, the characters like Dr. Cox always like super serious making fun and then like his best friend dies and it's just like he loses his shit and you're like oh no <laughs> no it's so sad Fellow wrestler Chris Jericho recounted on the dark side of the ring Benoit's behavior at Eddie's funeral, where he was practically inconsolable. Funerals are never good, but Eddie's funeral was very hard. When I saw Benoit, he came and gave me a hug, but it was the most desperate, saddest, I'm hanging on for dear life hug. Chris Benoit never seemed to get over Eddie's death, cutting off contact with many of his other friends and practically becoming a hermit. There were times that Benoit would go to visit Eddie's family, where he would go up to the master bedroom and simply hug Eddie's pillow and cry as he laid on Eddie's side of the bed. His family eventually got him a journal to have him cope where he could write down and talk to Eddie as much as he wanted, and it seemed to help, but Benoit was very much a broken man, and combined with everything else, he was on a road to destruction, a ticking time bomb that would explode less than two years later. The Horror in Fayetteville and that brings us up to date, mere days before the weekends of June the 24th. For some time, Benoit had been acting strange. He seemed paranoid, on edge, as if he believed he would soon be fired from WWE, even oh, when that wasn't the case. He started taking different routes to the airport and to the gym, as if he believed he was being followed. Paranoia! Paranoia! And on June the 19th, 2007, Chris Benoit wrestled his last match, a qualifying bout against Elijah Burke for a spot in the ECW World title match that Sunday. During the match, Benoit seemed off. He seemed tired, sluggish, unfocused, something he'd never allowed himself to be while in the ring. Nancy seemed to sense that something was wrong. Benoit had become more aggressive at home, more so than usual, and combined with his rapidly growing paranoia, she was rightly frightened. Nancy told her friends on June the 19th, quote, I'm scared to death. If anything happens to me, look at Chris. Holy sh Nancy. If you're if you, if you're listening to this episode, and you've if you've had a conversation with someone and you said if anything happens to me, it's that person. You need to like go to the police. You need to leave that situation. You need to do something, because that I get we. This is a true crime show. We know what's happening next. Nancy is getting killed, isn't she? So if you've had that conversation where you've said like if someone kills me, it's that guy, then you know change it up. Do something about that, because that's very, very worrying. Or just kill them first. Just joking, don't kill anyone. On June the 22nd, Benoit made the 40-mile drive down to Carrollton, Georgia, to visit Dr. Phil Astin III. Dr. Astin was a well-known physician in the sports and wrestling community, having taken on many pro-wrestling patients. He had been prescribing Benoit with many different painkillers and steroids for years, and that day was no different. Uh-oh. While at the office, Benoit had his picture taken by Dr. Astin, a practice the doctor liked to do with some of his more famous patients. No, no. I know what the doctor I don't want a picture taken. It's supposed to be anonymous. I don't even want people knowing who my doctor is. <laughs> I know there's confidentiality, but still, like, no, dude. That's so weird. In the picture, Benoit can be seen giving the doctor a soft smile, but his eyes look vacant, distant, as if he's not all there. On that day, a pool cleaner had just finished up at the Benoit residence when he saw Chris and little Daniel outside barbecuing for dinner. He was the last person to see the whole family alive. Whatever exactly triggered the horrid events of the next two days is almost anyone's guess, but we do know the grim results. That night, the rabid Wolverine lived up to his nickname. In the upstairs bedroom of the home, Chris Benoit pounced on Nancy, easily overpowering the smaller woman. Blood surrounding the body and the wounds to her face and head suggest that Chris beat her viciously in a fit of rage. Binding her hands and feet, knee planted firmly into her back, Benoit wrapped his television cable around her neck, drew it tight, and pulled as hard as he could. In what was surely minutes of terror and agony, Nancy Benoit left this world at the hands of the man who had sworn to love her and keep her safe. Wrapping the body in a blanket, Benoit placed a Bible next to his dead wife, a sign of his newly found faith. Undoubtedly, another piece of influence from Eddie, who himself was a born-again Christian. Next was Daniel Benoit. The child probably had no idea of the ferocity that had just befallen his mother that he loved so dearly, his bedroom being on the other side of the house from his parents' room. Hours later, after murdering his wife, Benoit entered the room of his sleeping son. It's believed that Benoit woke Daniel up and tried to give him a Xanax, the drug being found in his system after the fact. Daniel idolized his daddy, posted of Chris lovingly on the walls, and action figures stood proudly on the shelves. The man who Daniel loved more than anything in the world then proceeded to strangle the little boy to death. The use of Xanax perhaps showing that he hadn't wanted his son to suffer as his wife had. Then, like Nancy, he wrapped Daniel in a blanket, 
placing another Bible next to his body. At least 10 hours later, after Daniel left this world, Chavo Guerrero received an odd voicemail on his phone. It was from Chris, and it said that Nancy and Daniel were suffering from food poisoning and that he was home looking after them. Chavo recounted how odd Benoit sounded while on the phone when he called him back that night, that a lot of what he said sounded groggy and forced, especially the emphasis Benoit put on the end of the call when he said, Chavo, I love you. In the early morning of June the 24th, the day of the pay-per-view in Houston, a series of text messages were sent from Benoit's phone to several people within the WWE, including Chavo Guerrero. The first message was, The dogs are in the enclosed pool area. Garage side door is open. The second message was, My physical address is 130 Green Meadow Lane, Fayetteville, Georgia, 30215. Minutes later, the same exact message was sent to Nancy's phone. Chavo and the others didn't think anything of it when the next day rolled around and Chris wasn't at the airport to be picked up. They simply thought it was weird, but they decided to cover for him anyway. It wasn't until Monday that they told some of the officials within WWE of the messages. The higher-ups then called the Fayetteville County Sheriff's Office to provide a wellness check on Benoit and his family. Arriving at the house, officers had difficulty entering the house as both of Benoit's German shepherds were outside barking and growling. A neighbor soon came outside and, knowing the dogs, was able to put them aside and take a look in the house herself. Within moments, the officers heard a terrible scream as the neighbor came bolting out, a look of sheer sadness and panic on her face. She was crying out that little Daniel was dead. Entering the still silent house, the officers searched room by room, soon came to discover the bodies of Nancy and Daniel Benoit. It didn't take long for them to find the man of the house. Chris Benoit, aged 40, was found in his basement gym, hanging lifeless by the lap pull-down machine, the steel cord wrapped around his neck. It's believed that, after sending the text to Chavo and the other recipients, Benoit went downstairs, placed a cloth over his neck, wrapped the cord around his throat, adjusted the weights, and let it drop. A tragedy in every meaning of the word. A family utterly annihilated, leaving one question to be answered. It's so st- it, it, I feel like he must have just snapped. Like, it feels like such a bizarre crime. Even though he did have a bit of a history of violence, to escalate that to murder? When he's, he doesn't see, he's not a psycho. Like, he had this, like, super emotions and all of this stuff. It just seems like he totally snapped. Just lost his mind. Well, it's crazy. Like, if you want to kill yourself, why would you kill your family first? That makes no sense. The question of why. As the world was adjusting to the shocking news of Benoit's death and what he did to his family, theories popped up over the media as well as with fans. The first was, of course, the idea of steroids, that this act of evil was caused by roid rage. Toxicology reports on Benoit after his death showed that he had over 10 times the normal amount of testosterone in his body at the time of death. Now, this was surprising. Benoit had been a known steroid user for almost all of his career, trying to make up for his short stature. This was a fact, regardless of whether WWE tried to dissuade it or not, particularly since just two months earlier, Chris had passed one of the company's random drug tests, which apparently also tested for steroids. <laughs> Sounds like he cheated that then, doesn't it? This painted WWE in quite the negative light, even when they did their best to distance themselves from Benoit, especially after a massive drug bust and uncovered receipts for 14 WWE wrestlers that had purchased steroids recently, Chavo Guerrero being one. After the death of the Benoit family, the office of Dr. Aston was raided by the authorities and evidence was found that the good doctor, having written illegal prescriptions to his patients, Benoit included. He was taken to trial, and his lawyer attempted to get evidence thrown out, stating that the police had exceeded their authority when it came to their search warrant and seized other patient records, along with three years of bank records and computers. It was all for naught, though, as in 2008, Dr. Aston was charged with overprescribing medication, and in January 2009, he pled guilty to all 175 charges against him, including illegally prescribing drugs, sometimes without even examining his patients, and he was given 10 years behind bars. Good. That's crazy. I mean, <laughs> a heavy sentence. <laughs> but the amount of damage you're calling, you're a drug dealer. You're doing, you're just a drug dealer at that point, aren't you? And it's like anyone who's being prescribed prescription painkillers for years, that's just not right. That's not what prescription painkillers are for. They're for like acute pain or like for end of life care, like post surgery or like serious pain. But if people are on like opioids and stuff long term, that's why there's the opioid crisis. Because everyone's addicted to these things, even though they shouldn't be. They should be used short term. Don't be prescribing. There should be an absolute limit on this stuff. It's crazy. The second and most prevalent theory for Benoit's actions is brain damage, namely chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, a neurodegenerative disease caused by repeated head and brain trauma we were talking about earlier. Symptoms include behavioral problems, mood problems, and difficulty thinking, which could lead to a patient delivering, developing dementia over time. 
Chris Nowinski, founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation and co-founder of the Boston University CTE Center, is also a former WWE wrestler, one whose career was ended due to multiple untreated concussions. Talking about Chris Benoit, Nowinski has been quoted as saying, Benoit is one of the only guys who would take a chair shot to the back of the head, which is stupid. He also recalled speaking with Benoit only months before the tragedy, and he asked Benoit how many concussions he had received in his life. Benoit answered, more than I can remember. I'm going to say it's a combination of all of these things, right? He's had the multiple head traumas. He's on steroids. He seemed to be going through this intense period of grief. Also, uh, the paranoia and stuff possibly caused by the former things. But it's a, it's a crazy combination that's not going to end well and doesn't end well. Julian Bales, head of neurosurgery at West Virginia University, at the assistance of Lewinsky and Benoit's father, Michael, ran scans and tests of Chris Benoit's brain. The results were shocking. Benoit's brain was so severely damaged it resembled the brain of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. Severe CTE was found while examining his brain tissue, along with damage to the brain stem and all four lobes. All those diving headbutts and chair shots to the head had finally caught up to the rabid wolverine, resulting in a skull full of almost nothing but brown, dead brain cells. A strict no chair shots to the head policy was soon enacted by WWE in the wake of the revelation, and, and more promotions quickly followed their lead in an attempt to prevent further cases, such as that of Benoit. Conspiracy theories have popped up over the years, such as one suggesting that Kevin Sullivan, in an act of revenge from years ago, killed the family, or that perhaps the deaths were the result of a professional hit. Each one is more ridiculous than the last, and they only work to highlight what is accepted to this day as truth. Chris Benoit, in a state of rage and brain-damaged delirium, brutally beat and strangled his wife Nancy and then drugged and strangled his youngest son. Then, whether from the guilt of it all or just in an act to end his long-standing suffering, he hanged himself, taking any concrete answer to all of the lingering questions to the grave. On July the 14th, 2007, Nancy and Daniel Benoit received a memorial service attended by their friends and family along with several employees from WWE. Their bodies were cremated and were given to Nancy's family in starfish shaped urns. Chris Benoit was cremated in private. The fate of his ashes are unknown to this day. Wrap up. So that brings us to the end of this dark journey. I have to admit that this was a hard one. Chris Benoit was one of my favorite wrestlers at the time, and sometimes I wonder what would have happened had the horror of that weekend's not come to pass. Would he have died soon anyway from his brain damage, as some say? Would he have retired and gotten the help that he needed? Would he have trained others in his craft and eventually made it into the Hall of Fame himself? In the end, we'll never know. I could still watch his matches to this day and enjoy them for what they are, but the darkness of what he did will always be there whenever I or anyone else looks back at his work. Yeah, you've got to be watching some of those early matches and see him taking a chair to that and being like, we don't know where this ends up. And then you think about him murdering his family. I don't know if I could watch those. Not that I'd enjoy them anyway, because it'd be disgusting. I don't really like wrestling. But if I did, I, d- I don't know. Oof. His name is stricken from all but the history books, but only when it comes to his title victories. Matches that were promoted with him now solely promote his opponents, and any past show or event that features him on the card now comes with parental warnings. His show, his tribute show on Raw, is not available on the WWE Network, and Vince's address of him on ECW has been removed from that episode. They're doing their best to distance themselves from the man. And honestly, who can blame them? I believe Paul Heyman, one of the great wrestling managers and personalities of all time, said it best when he was interviewed live for Inside the Ropes in 2019 and was faced with a heckler in the crowd in regards to Benoit. And here's a quote. You can admire his work all you want, but I'll give you my take on it since you want to keep yelling out, my boy. Three people died in that house that night. I don't care about CTE. Three people died in that house that night. Only one person had the choice behind it. The other two didn't have the choice to die. So if that's your boy, f*** you. As a performer amongst the five greatest I've ever seen in my life. As a talent, remarkable. As a human being, I don't care about CTE. I don't care about what the reasons are. Nancy and Daniel had no option. He did. As we finish up this tale of tragedy, there's one person I feel for more than anyone else. David Benoit. Now almost 30 years old, he's still plagued by the events of that weekend. In one fell swoop, he lost his father, his stepmother, his little brother, all of whom he loved so very much. It's been a hard road for him, and he still idolizes his father, knowing the man who shattered his world wasn't truly the man who loved and raised him, that all the damage to his brain and the years of steroid abuse had taken that man away. Over the last several years, he's been training to be a wrestler himself, but with the darkness surrounding his last name and his striking resemblance to his dad, I can only hope he's given the chance to live his dream. He more than deserves to forge his own destiny, outside of his father's looming shadow. Yeah, well said. 
well said this has been an episode of the casual criminalist i hope you find it interesting if you did if you're watching on youtube please like and subscribe if you're watching as a podcast hey leave a review it's greatly appreciated thank you so much and i'll see you next time